EGR 6163, Project Management, Module 2, Lecture 1, Organization Strategy and Project Selection. My objectives for this module are to explain why it's important for project managers to understand their organizational strategy. We also want to identify the significant role projects contribute to the strategic direction of the organization. We also apply financial and non-financial criteria to assess the value of projects and we'll apply an objective priority system to uh, select our project. The reading assignment is Larson, Chapter 2. Strategy is fundamentally deciding how the organization will compete with other, other companies and other organizations. Each organization uses projects to convert strategy into new products, services, and processes needed for success. Aligning the projects with strategic goals of the organization is crucial for business success. Chapter 2 presents an overview of the importance of strategic planning and the process for developing a strategic plan. The two main reasons why project managers need to understand their organization's mission and strategy. First of all, uh, it's so they can make appropriate decisions and adjustments. For example, how would a project manager respond to a suggestion that to modify the design of a project or to delays that may vary depending on strategic concerns. They can also be useful to uh, effectively uh, advocate for projects. Project managers have to be able to demonstrate to senior management how their project contributes to the firm's mission in order to gather their continued support. It can also be useful to explain to stock stakeholders why certain project objectives and priorities are crucial in order to secure buy-in on conscientious trade-off decisions. I also explain why the project is important to motivate and empower the project team. So strategic management process, this is, the big, this is an overview. So what, what is it? It's the process of answering what we are and deciding uh, how to implement, implement what we intend to be and how we are going to get there. This is a continuous process, it's iterative, and it's aimed at developing an integrated and coordinated long-term plan of action. It requires very strong links among mission goals, uh, objectives, strategy, and implementation. There are two major dimensions of strategic management. The first one is to be able to respond to changes in the external environment and allocate the firm's scarce resources to improve its competitive position. There are also internal responses to new action programs aimed at enhancing the competitive position of the firm. The four activities to the strategic management process. First is to review and define the organizational mission. The mission identifies what we want to become. Mission statements identify the scope of the organization in terms of its products and services. The second is to analyze and formulate strategies. Formulating strategies answers the question of what needs to be done to reach our objectives. Strategy formulation includes determining and evaluating alternatives that support the organization objectives and selecting the best alternative. The third one is to set objectives to achieve strategies. Objectives translate the organization's strategy into specific, concrete, and measurable terms. Objectives answer in detail where a firm is headed and when is it going to get there. And finally, to implement strategies through projects. Implementation answers the questions of how strategies are, will be realized given available resources. So this graphic is an overview of the, of the process. Uh, you know, first we, we have to uh, come up with our mission statement to figure out what we are now. Uh, once we figure out what we are now, we can set strategies and objectives uh, to determine, uh, you know, what do we want to be. That leads to some portfolios of strategic choices we have to be made, a strategy implementation. Uh, once we figure that out, we can, we can implement strategies to get where we uh, want to be. And that is formed through projects. That's how projects fit in to the uh, whole mission mission statement. So objectives 
The key thing with objectives is that they translate the organization's strategy into specific, concrete, and measurable terms. Our book gives a little acronym called SMART. Uh, an objective has to be specific, it has to be measurable, it has to be assignable, realistic, and time-related. Uh, if you're messing with one of these, uh, then you really don't have an objective. So they, once we figure out you know, our mission statement and we, we define our uh, uh, projects we want to, want to do, uh, we need to come up with uh, what's known as a project priority system. These are ways to implement our projects. Uh, and unfortunately, implementation of projects without a strong priority system to, to figure out which projects we're going to do uh, can often link uh, to uh, problems. And so uh, this little slide points out the three common problems that, that you end up having. The first one is what's known as an implementation gap. Uh, and that occurs because in many organizations, top level management uh, formulate the strategy and leave the implementation of the strategy to, to uh, the managers. Uh, so, you know, the, the problem is that since the objectives and strategies are made independently, uh, you know, from the mission statement, that can cause a disconnect between the strategy and priorities, and that's what's known as the implementation gap. The second problem occurs because you, you, in every organization, you have organizational politics. Uh, this can have a significant influence on which projects receive funding and which receive priority. Uh, this is especially true when the, priority, when the criteria and processes for selecting projects are ill-defined and not aligned with the mission of the firm. Uh, project selection may not be based so much on facts and sound reasoning as it is on uh, you know, the individual person advocating for the projects. So th this is you know, another reason why you need a, a pr project priority system that uh, you know, uh, doesn't have all these problems built in, so you have a fair objective measure on what projects get funded. And finally, the third problem is you have resource conflicts and multitasking problems. Uh, most projects operate in a multi-project environment. There's many projects going on at the same time. Uh, this can cause problems with project independence, interdependency, and the need to share resources among projects. Sharing resources can also lead to what's called multitasking, which involves starting and stopping work on one task to go work on another project and then returning to work on the original task. You know, we, you find that people working on several tasks concurrently are far less efficient with, than working on one single task. Uh, multitasking uh, in terms of projects adds to delays and costs. <laughs> So what are some of the benefits of project portfolio management? First, it builds discipline into project selection process. It links project selection to strategic metrics and the mission statement. It prioritizes project proposals across a common set of criteria rather than on politics or emotion. It allocates resources to projects that align with the strategic direction of the firm. It balances risk across all projects. It also justifies killing projects that do not support the organizational strategy. And finally, it improves communication and supports uh, agreement among uh, project goals. So many organizations finally have three basic kinds of projects in their portfolio. The first is what's called compliance projects. These are must do. These are, these are uh, uh, emergency kind of actions you must take uh, typically to uh, come in compliance with some kind of federal or state regulation. So these are, these are needed to, for uh, regulatory conditions uh, required to operate in a region. Uh, hence, they're, they're, all called, they're what's called must-do. Uh, for example, you know, uh, these are kind of projects such as, uh, you know, building an auto parts factory uh, destroyed by a, a hurricane or uh, recovering a crash network. These are examples of must-do projects. Uh, these compliance and emergency projects usually have penalties if they're not uh, implemented. The second type of projects are what's called operational projects. These are those that needed to support current operations. 
These projects typically are designed to improve the efficiency or, de or delivery of systems, uh, to reduce costs, and to improve the performance. And finally, there's what's known as the strategic projects. Um, these are uh, directly support the organization's long-term uh, mission. Uh, they frequently are directed toward increasing revenue or market share. Examples of strategic projects are, are new products, new technologies, uh, research and development. So before we delve into the, the fine details of project selection, we need to put all this in, uh, into perspective. Uh, this selection process is the first part of the management system that spans the entire lifetime of the project. Uh, the system has been described as a series of gates that a project must pass through in order to be completed. Um, the purpose is to ensure that the organization is investing time and resources on worthwhile projects uh, that contribute to this mission and strategy. Each gate associated with a project uh, phase represents a decision point. Um, so this, this kind of lays out uh, this slide, the, the strategy here. Uh, you know, these gates, uh, the project must pass through. Uh, each gate can lead to three possible outcomes. Uh, you know, go, go ahead and proceed with the, uh, with the project. Uh, kill the project, uh, recycle, uh, revise and resubmit the project. So first of all, this, uh, let's talk about, you know, here's, here's phase one, I would call it. This is, uh, uh, this is this phase is often uh, invisible. It occurs inside the head of a person who has an idea for a project and must decide whether it's worthwhile uh, investing the time and effort to submit a formal proposal uh, up to the chain of command. Uh, so you know that's the first that's the first phase. And so so here's gate one. Uh, you know you can kill it. You can you can uh, revise it. You can you can uh, modify it at that point as well. And then you have to phase two, which is the actual proposal. Uh, so if, if, if a person believes this idea is worthwhile, then uh, the project proposal is submitted conforming to the selection guidelines of the firm. You go through gate two. Then you get up to phase, phase three, which is the screening and selection process. Uh, up to gate four, which is the implementation, implementation plan. So phases three and four, uh, you know, if this preliminary proposal is approved uh, back here through gate two, uh, then the project manager and staff are assigned to develop more, more comprehensive implementation plan that occurs in phases three and four. Uh, this preliminary proposal is usually revised and expanded, uh, and you add some uh, uh, detailed information regarding you know, schedule, cost, uh, resource requirements, uh, risk management, and so forth. Then if it makes it through that uh, selection and implementation plan, uh, you're up to phase five, which is a, a progress evaluation. Uh, so, you know, after gate four, the, pro the project is underway, uh, you know, and even when it's underway, you're still going to go back and you're going to evaluate it. Uh, you know, uh, usually, typically, uh, you know, uh, more than one time you'll pass through this phase five. Uh, the main purpose of this phase five uh, progress evaluation is uh, to assess the performance and determine, you know, if you have to make adjustments, uh, you know, to resources or, or uh, uh, personnel assigned to it. Uh, then, you know, as you finish the, uh, the project, you go through gate five, gate, uh, I'm sorry, gate five here. Uh, you know, and this, uh, this last phase is uh, uh, sort of like the finish line. It's, it's here that uh, the customer acceptance has been achieved and management has signed off on the, uh, on the project. Uh, and here, you know, coming through here, you reach up to what's called the closure stage where you have a, uh, a, uh, a project audit to assess the success, uh, as well as maybe, you know, some lessons learned uh, on what you learned from the project itself. So finally, we get to the selection criteria. You know, what kind of criteria are we going to use to select uh, what projects we, we fund? Well, you know, there are really two two categories. There's what's called the financial criteria uh, or the non-financial criteria. Now, you know, back in the old days, it was pretty much everybody just did the financial criteria, uh, and we'll talk about that next. Uh, but lately, you know, the last 10, 15 years, they've also added what's called non-financial criteria, uh, and we'll talk about that as well. And uh, 
uh, we'll also talk about the, the checklist models and the uh, multi-weighted scoring models in, in lecture two. So first, let's talk about the, the financial criteria. There's basically two, two ways you can do this. The first one is, is uh, uh, the kind of simplified method. Uh, uh, it's called the payback model. It's, uh, it measures the time the project will, will take to recover the project investment. So to start a project, you know, you have to have certain money up front to start it. Well, how long is it going to take us to uh, recoup our investment? Uh, and obviously, you desire, desire a shorter payback period. Uh, you know, so this this payback model is the simplest and most widely used. Uh, it emphasizes cash flow, and uh, it does have some limitations, though. It uh, uh, ignores the time value of money, which which uh, the second method will actually uh, take that into account. So what does what does time value of money mean? Is it means a dollar today is worth more than a dollar dollar next week, right? Because uh, if I have a dollar today, I can invest it, and I can I can earn interest on it. Uh, so it's worth more than a, than a dollar. Uh, next week. Uh, that also assumes the cash inflows for the investment period uh, and uh, only uh, and does not consider profitability. So the payback formula is pretty simple. It's the payback period in years is equal to the estimated project cost divided by the annual savings. So let's look at the pay, payback method for uh, two projects, Project A and Project B. Uh, project A, the initial investment is $700,000. With an annual savings calculated to be 225,000. Project B is 400,000, and the annual savings is 110,000. So these are these are the givens, uh, the investment and the annual savings. Now the payback period, that's simply found by dividing uh, the investment divided by the annual savings. So here's the formula. So when you plug that in, you get you know it would take 3.1 3 years to pay back Project A. For Project B. Uh, 3.6 years. Uh, you divide uh, 400,000 by 110,000. The rate of return is simply the, the uh, inverse of uh, uh, the payback period uh, in percentages. Uh, so the rate of return for Project A is 32.1%. For Project B is 27.5%. So, you know, uh, we're told in the, in the book that, you know, that. Uh, uh, you know, we, we're going to accept it if the if it's uh, uh, the payback period is less than five years and exceeds 15% desired rate. That's what we're given. So in this case, uh, both of these are acceptable. Uh, but again, the problem here is that this doesn't use the the uh, time value of money. So let's look at the, the second method uh, and figure out how to do that. So the second method is called the net present value method. And uh, uh, so here, you know, uh, when you calculate it, and Excel has a formula to calculate it. Uh, uh, I'll show you how to, how to do that in Excel. There's a mathematical formula. You could do it by hand, but, but, but uh, uh, there's no reason to do that when you have Excel. It's, uh, uh, Excel will do it for you automatically. You just plug in the, the, the relevant columns uh, and rows. So first of all, you know, when you calculate this, you know, what does it mean? Well. Uh, you prefer uh, a positive net uh, positive value to negative net positive value. Uh, and if both of them are positive, you rather have the higher positive. Uh, and again, it's more realistic because it considers the time value of money, uh, cash flows, and profitability. So here's the example. It's a, uh, example, um, uh, the same example, basically. It's uh, uh, except here, uh, you know, we got the 15%. Uh, uh, so the top uh, uh, column uh, rows 5 through 10 is Project A, and then rows uh, uh, 13 through 18 is Project B. And uh, I'll send you the Excel uh, a template here so you can actually go through these numbers yourself. Um, so year zero, this is our initial investment, the, the uh, uh, I0. The, uh, uh, and then uh, for the inflows, we have uh, uh, each year we're going to have to, uh, you know, 225,000. Uh, um, the net inflows is just, uh, 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 since there's only one value here, this, uh, each one of these just comes down to this next row here. Uh, so, so here, the total, you just sum across uh, the, uh, there's only one outflow, it's, uh, so that sums across here for the total. And here, the inflows, again, uh, uh, this is just the sum of uh, year one through year five. 
Um, and then uh, for the t this number is so the difference between these two values. So here for uh, for the net positive value, you take uh, uh, here's the formula C7, which is the initial investment, plus uh, the Excel formula uh, is net positive value. B6 is the uh, uh, you know what you want to get the return you want to get, and then it's 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 uh, you're doing a uh, D7 through H9. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, D9 through H H9, which is uh, uh, this value uh, plus this value plus that value plus that value is fed into there. And then the, uh, the formula calculates it here. So it ends up being a positive 54,235. Well, when you do the same thing for uh, project B, you find it's a negative value. So here, uh, you know, it's pretty simple. You, uh, you want to accept project A and, and uh, reject project B. Uh, and that's why, you know, the net positive value method is, is much more uh, accurate and uh, much more uh, uh, realistic in the real world. Okay, I'll see you guys in uh, in lecture two.